Dead America, Low Country Part 18 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 The mood outside the large plantation house was tense. The survivors were holed up inside, covering every side as best they could from the small army of mercenaries on the outside, led by the malicious Mosley. Inside, Coleman sat on the second floor, aiming towards a group of five men to the east of the house. In the rear kitchen, Kenny and Dante kept watch in case the men they'd beaten back earlier wanted a second dose. To the west, Hawk, Eddie, Grace, and Captain Nico kept watch eyeballing the two escape vehicles parked just a few yards away from the window. Much to their relief, none of the mercenaries had made it to that side of the house yet. At the front, ducked down behind a makeshift barricade of cars, Terrell, Kemp, and No Name hunkered down, the taunts and threats of death coming from Mosley just a few moments before still seemed to resonate in the air, hanging over them like a black cloud. Don't suppose you have a contingency plan to get us out of this, do you? No Name asked. Terrell grinned. Shit, man. My contingency plans have contingency plans, he drawled. No Name smirked, shaking his head. The captain pulled out a walkie-talkie and clicked it on. Tate, my man, how are we looking? he asked. Sitting pretty in the display window, came the redneck's reply. Two guns mounted and ready to fire. How are you looking? Terrell shook his head. We're in some trouble, he said. Definitely going to be company when we come your way. How many? Tate asked. The captain took a deep breath. At least three SUVs, he replied. And probably a helicopter. There was a pause, and then Tate came back. I don't know how good of a shot you think I am, but I'm pretty sure I can't take down a chopper he admitted. You just need to worry about the SUVs, Terrell promised. I don't expect you to stop all of them. Any time you can buy us, though, we'll go a long way. I got sixty bullets racked up with their name on them, Tate replied firmly. Just let me know when you're en route. Gonna take us a minute to figure that out, Terrell explained. You'll hear from us shortly. I'll be here, Tate promised. The captain put the walkie-talkie away and glanced at No Name, his bald head bobbing in a nod. Nothing wrong with a little ambush, he said. Now we just have to get to it, Kemp piped up. Got you covered, Terrell declared. Two SUVs on the west side of the house, right by the windows. We just have to buy enough time to get into them, and we're out. Ambush spot is about two miles away, and our spot is just a few miles on the other side of that. Kemp opened his mouth to speak, but the captain raised a hand to stop his question. And before you ask, yes, I have a contingency plan for that, too, he said. But one thing at a time. Gotta make our escape first. I wasn't expecting this level of coordinated resistance, so I'm open to suggestions. No Name nodded thoughtfully. I think I have an idea, he said slowly. I'll be back. He stayed low, running back towards the house. A couple of shots erupted at his back, and Terrell and Kemp opened fire, hitting the vehicles the mercenaries were hiding behind to push them back behind cover. "'That's got to be a fun debate they're having,' Terrell uttered. Kemp raised an eyebrow. "'What debate?' he asked. "'Seeing who the first one over the top is,' the captain drawled, with a smirk, knowing that they're going to lose the better part of their head when they go. Kemp chuckled. "'Always hated losing those debates.' he said. You seem to have managed okay, Terrell replied, cocking his head. The mercenary wrinkled his nose. Tell that to the twenty-seven metal pins in my body, he said. Guessing you either don't fly commercial that often, Terrell joked, or you insist the TSA agent buy you dinner first. Kemp fanned himself with a flourish. What can I say? I need to be finessed, he quipped. Terrell chuckled, and they continued to keep watch on the mercenaries to make the move they knew was coming. No Name made it into the house unscathed, making his way through until he found Captain Nico, who was in the side room by the vehicles with Grace, Hawk, and Eddie. Captain, I was wondering what you had left in your goodie bag there, 
No Name said, inclining his head to the captain's stash. Nico grinned. Let us see, my friend, he said, and headed over to a nearby table, dumping out his back. There were two small pipe bombs with fuses, and one that looked like a pound of plastic explosives with a digital timer on it. No Name pointed to the latter. That one, he said, picking it up and tossing it in the air a few times to test the weight. Where's Kenny? He looked around and then bellowed. Kenny! Need you! In the kitchen, came the cold reply. Need somebody to tag out with me. On it, Hawk said and jumped to his feet, running out with his gun in hand. Kenny headed in and walked right up to No Name and Nico. How we looking? he asked. We got a plan, the bold mercenary replied, but we're gonna need your arm and your feet. Kenny cocked a brow. You know I wasn't a quarterback, right? he asked. You telling me your arm isn't any good? No Name quipped. Kenny shook his head, raising a hand. Oh no, I can chuck it, he assured him. Just don't expect pinpoint accuracy. Well, you know that old adage, No Name said, rolling a hand in the air. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Kenny raised an eyebrow. Yeah? he asked. No Name tossed the block of explosives to the football player. We're adding C4 to that list, he declared. If I miss with this, then I'm going to have to stop saying I was a pro ball player, Kenny said with a smirk. Question is, though, where am I going to throw it from? Because I saw the front of the house coming down the hallway, and I doubt those boys outside are going to give me much chance to get wound up. No Name raised his chin. How do you feel about heights? he asked. Kenny grimaced. Last time I was higher than ten feet off the ground, he said slowly. I ended up hanging off the side of an 18th floor patio. So you're comfortable with them. Fantastic. No name deadpanned. Follow me. Kenny looked like he was resisting the urge to roll his eyes, instead following no name up the stairs at a brisk pace. They reached the top floor landing, looking around for an attic hatch. Finally, the bold mercenary found it, pulling it down and clambering up the ladder. The attic was largely abandoned with only a few boxes in the corner. No Name scanned the inside of the roof, finally finding an access panel at the far end of the room. Bingo, he said, and rushed over to open it up. Sunlight bathed the area and No Name carefully peeked over the edge. The hatch led to a flat-ish area of roof, which was far enough back from the edge that they could get outside without being seen by the mercenaries on the ground. Stay low when we go out, the bold man said quietly. Kenny nodded and followed him out onto the roof, the duo crawling towards the front of the house and staying out of sight. Finally, they spotted Mosley's vehicle, and No Name stopped. That's our target right there, he said. When we give the signal, I want you to chuck this thing as hard as you can in that direction. Kenny raised an eyebrow. Then what? he asked. Haul ass downstairs, No Name replied, because we're not going to have much time before we hit the road. Kenny took a deep breath and pursed his lips before shaking his head. Man, that's not a lot of time for me to get down there, he mused. Come on now, I thought you pro athletes were supposed to be fast. No name drawled, only half joking. I mean, we are, Kenny said, wrinkling his nose. But that's some light speed right there. The bold mercenary pointed to the SUV target and the men behind it. If you need some extra motivation... Every single one of those men down there are going to want to put a bullet in your head for throwing a block of C4 in their direction, he said dryly. You're going to want to be as far away from them as possible. That's a lot better motivation than having a linebacker chase me, Kenny admitted. There you go, No Name said, clapping him on the back. And don't worry, I'm not going to leave you behind, you have my word on that. Kenny chuckled under his breath. The bold mercenary's brow furrowed. Something funny? he asked. Don't get me wrong, I believe you and all, the football player assured him. It just struck me that this is the absolute best kind of promise someone can make. No name tongued his cheek. How so? he asked. Because if you break it, I won't be around to call you out on it, Kenny explained. No name chuckled and clapped him on the back again, shaking his head. Be ready for our signal, he reminded him as he began to crawl backwards towards the hatch. What's it going to be? Kenny asked. The bold mercenary paused. 
When it sounds like a war has broken out, throw and run, he said. Kenny nodded firmly and turned back to the front as No Name made his way back into the attic and headed back down the ladder. He stopped at Coleman's room, poking his head in. How are we looking? he asked. The sniper shrugged, not looking away from his scope. Got a few of them pinned down behind the SUV, he replied. Nobody has wanted to play hero yet, though. Hard to blame them, No Name said. How's our escape plan coming along? Coleman asked. The bold mercenary raised his fingers. We're out in five, maybe less, he said. As soon as you hear gunfire, start running for the vehicles. You got it, Coleman promised. No Name headed back down to the escape room where Eddie, Nico, and Grace were keeping watch. The windows were wide open so they could quickly get to the SUVs. We're getting ready to move, No Name explained. So when the firing starts, I want you all loaded up and ready to roll. Grace cocked her head. Who's driving? she asked. I'm taking one. Terrell or Dante will take the other, the bold mercenary replied. They have an ambush set up and they know where we're going. So we're going to have to follow. How soon until we get moving? Eddie asked, raising a hand. Minutes, No Name said. But as soon as the words left his mouth, a torrent of gunfire erupted outside startling everyone in the room, even him. Make that seconds, Eddie quipped. No name sprung into action, readying his weapon. Get into the vehicles now, he barked. Cover the flanks and be ready for us. The trio nodded and hopped out of the windows, Grace and Eddie keeping an eye to the side to make sure QXR wasn't coming around. No name rushed into the hallway, hearing gunfire coming from all directions and upstairs. He turned towards the kitchen. Dante! Hawk, he bellowed. Get over here, we gotta move. Dante continued to fire out the windows and Hawk glanced back over his shoulder. They're raiding us, he cried. Pin them down in the hallway, but we gotta leave now, No Name yelled. Hawk nodded before smacking Dante on the shoulder to get his attention. The duo began retreating down the hallway as bullets ripped through the kitchen, sending glass and wooden shards flying through the air. As they ran up to the side room, Hawk took up position on the corner while Dante rushed out to get into the driver's seat. No Name, meanwhile, headed out to the front, where an all-out gun battle was taking place. Terrell and Kemp popped up over the hoods of the cars, taking pot shots at the approaching mercenaries and forcing them to take cover, hitting the ground and jumping back behind their vehicle. The bold mercenary fired off several shots as he took a knee behind a wooden column on the front porch. We're moving, he barked. We have to keep them pinned down if we're getting out of here, Terrell cried, and as if on cue, the block of C4 bounced on the ground halfway between the barricade and the SUV. As soon as it hit the ground, the mercenaries who had been approaching hopped up and started running away. No name fired, hitting one in the back and dropping him to the ground, still close to the bomb. Kemp and Terrell broke from cover, rushing into the house, quickly followed by their bold companion. A moment later, the C4 detonated, rocking the entire house. The front windows shattered, debris dropping down from the wooden ceiling as the board shook. Kemp, get in Dante's vehicle and go, No Name instructed. We're right behind you. His second didn't respond or argue, just rushed off to the SUV, grabbing Hawk as he did. Terrell took up Hawk's position, firing down the hallway towards the kitchen and keeping the approaching mercenaries at bay. No Name headed towards the vehicle, getting into the driver's seat and firing it up, rolling down the front windows as he did. He kept his head on a swivel, looking for attackers. He didn't have to wait long. A lone mercenary came running around the front of the house, forcing No Name to open fire. The shots narrowly missed the merc who dove back around cover. The bold mercenary looked back towards the house, letting out a loud whistle to get his companion's attention. We're being flanked! We gotta go! he cried. Coleman finally dove through the window, skidding around the driver's side and diving into the back seat. As he did, he fired a couple of times towards the back of the house, keeping a couple more mercenaries pinned. Where the hell is Kenny? No Name barked. He was right behind me, Coleman cried, leaning back out to fire again towards the back of the house. No Name looked inside, spotting Terrell standing up to empty a magazine's worth of bullets towards the kitchen. As he did this, Kenny tore from the stairs, the wooden walls exploding around him, splinters flying everywhere. Once he was clear, the captain followed, backing through the living room, 
Kenny dove into the back seat as Terrell fired a few more bullets towards the front of the house, before jumping into the passenger seat next to No Name. Go, go, go! he yelled, and No Name didn't need any prompting, punching the gas. The SUV launched across the grass towards the road. Coleman continued the fire back towards the house to keep the enemy at bay. Where am I going? No Name asked, voice calm and steady despite his racing heart. Stay on this road for a mile or so, Terrell replied. When you come to the end of it, hang a left. The bold mercenary nodded as he focused on the path ahead, trusting his companions to take care of everything else. Mercenary SUVs pursued them and the telltale sound of helicopter blades joined the cacophony in the distance. They're coming in hot, Kenny warned. How close? Terrell asked as he reloaded his rifle. Kenny shook his head wildly. Fifteen? he asked. Twenty seconds behind? I can work with that, the captain said, and pulled out his walkie-talkie, raising it to his lips. Tate, you copy? Had a feeling you might be calling, Tate drawled. Just saw an SUV fly by here. Terrell nodded in relief. Dante got a head start on us, he said. We will be on you in less than a minute. Hostiles ten to fifteen seconds behind us. They won't know what hit em, Tate promised. My man, Terrell replied, raising a victory fist. And good luck. If it's not safe to get to the rendezvous point, just lay low and we'll come get you once we're through this. Ten four, Tate agreed. Terrell put down the walkie-talkie and raised his assault rifle, taking a peek out the window at the trailing trio of SUVs in the distance. Too far for a clean shot, he murmured. How much farther on this road? No Name asked. Half mile, then a hard right, Terrell explained, motioning with his hands. From there, it's a quarter mile to the next turn. You have confidence in Tate to get this job done? No Name asked thinly. The captain nodded. He should be able to take out one, he replied. Anything else past that is gravy. At this point, I'll take it, the bold mercenary said. The chopper blades grew louder and Terrell stuck his head out the window. It trailed them on the passenger side of the vehicle, matching their speed. He quickly raised his weapon. We got trouble, he barked. No name glanced to the side, spotting the chopper and the fifty cal machine gun on the side, ready to fire. Terrell stuck his weapon out the window, but the bold mercenary had an idea. Hang on, he yelled, and the passengers braced themselves just as he slammed on the brakes, sending everyone lurching forward. The gunner in the chopper opened fire but missed badly as the bullets impacted the road in front of them. No Name immediately hit the gas to pick speed back up as Terrell stuck his head and gun out the window to open fire on the rapidly approaching vehicles. As he did, Coleman reached into the front seat, grabbing the walkie-talkie from the captain. Tate! Window is tightened! he said quickly. By how much? the redneck asked. Coleman shook his head. Two, maybe three seconds at most! he replied. I'll do my best not to shoot you, Tate quipped. Oh, that's appreciated, the sniper cried, sarcasm evident in his tone, and then pocketed the radio as Terrell continued to fire at the vehicles quickly gaining on them. He peppered the front windshield of the lead vehicle, spider-webbing the glass. A mercenary on the passenger side stuck his head out and fired, hitting the back window of their vehicle. Kenny hit the deck as Coleman turned and began firing through the new opening. No name sped, his eye on the prize, pedal to the floor, quickly approaching the turn. Is this the turn? he asked. Terrell glanced over and nodded. Yeah, he said, and then resumed firing. Hang on, no name warned and cut the wheel hard, the tires squealing as they took the corner. Half a block up, the mercenaries behind them did the same thing. Where's the ambush? no name asked. Next corner, Terrell replied, and the bold mercenary laid on the horn. He hoped that would signal Tate without giving the mercenaries a heads up. As a horn bleated in the distance, Tate straightened up and grabbed onto both assault rifles he had rigged up. They were shoulder-width apart and mounted to a metal clothing rack. He knew they would move once he started firing, but he hoped that since they were on a horizontal bar, he could keep his aim relatively steady. The roar of the engines grew louder and louder as the lead SUV tore past the storefront moving at such a good pace that it was hard for him to get a good look at who was in the vehicle. His lips began to move. One one thousand, he murmured. Two one thousand. Three. 
He pulled the triggers on both guns, sending out a three-round burst. The initial barrage shattered the front glass of the store and impacted into the building across the street. He didn't stop firing, continually sending three-round bursts into the kill zone. His second pull smacked into the side of the lead mercenary vehicle, about leg high on the people inside. The vehicle didn't even slow down, but he noticed his aim was a little off and pointed the guns ever so slightly up as he pulled again. The second car wasn't as lucky as the first, the shots finding the windows, the driver's side window spiderwebbed with a splash of red coating the inside. The SUV swerved deliciously, spinning out before coming to a stop about twenty yards away. Tate was momentarily stunned that he'd hit a target that he hesitated on pulling the triggers again, giving the third vehicle a clear path through. Shit, he berated himself, and grabbed one of the rifles from the rack to step into the window. He aimed at the stationary vehicle and opened fire. Bullets ripped through the glass and into the back panel of the vehicle as the doors opened and five mercenaries scrambled for cover. The driver was moving a bit slower than the others, his arm covered in crimson. Within seconds, Tate was under heavy fire as his enemy showered the storefront with hot lead. He fired wildly as he retreated back into the store, dropping the gun after the final shots from the magazine. He quickly grabbed the other from the rack, falling to the ground in the process to avoid being shot. Rapid footsteps echoed outside and his heart went into overdrive. Get up, get up, he thought frantically, and scrambled to his feet just as the mercenaries got to the front window. He dove behind a display and out of sight, shoving away the rush of blood in his ears to listen hard to their footfalls over the broken glass. He listened carefully as their steps moved apart from each other and realized he was about to be flanked. Tate popped up and opened fire, and the three-round burst caught a mercenary in the chest, impacting his vest and sending him tumbling back to the ground, hurt but relatively uninjured. His partner returned fire, shredding the display that Tate had been hiding behind. He whipped around and fired an unaimed shot towards the other mercenary, but hit nothing but air. His opponent aimed and returned fire as he tried to run to the back of the store, but he wasn't fast enough, and his left shoulder exploded in pain. The impact sent him tumbling to the ground, and he smacked hard into the wooden floor, his gun sliding away from him. He gasped for air as he tried to pick himself up and escape, but a boot came down hard on the back and mercenaries crowded around him from the back entrance of the store. "'I would stay down if I were you,' one of them snarled. "'Go fuck yourself,' Tate huffed, and the boot moved to his wound, pressing hard. The redneck screamed in agony, writhing in pain against the dusty floor before his enemy let up, just enough to keep him quiet but keep him steady. "'Now you be a good little boy and shut the fuck up while the grown-ups talk,' the mercenary said with a sneer and Tate heard the telltale click of a walkie-talkie. Commander Mosley, come in. Second unit reporting. Holy hell, glad you boys are still kicking, came the drawled reply. Looked like a nasty little ambush there. Yes, sir, it was, the mercenary said. Casualties? Mosley asked. One injured, his lackey reported. And the culprits? the commander asked. Appears to be just one the mercenary said, giving Tate a shuffle with his boot, as if to accentuate his point. And he's been apprehended. Still alive? Mosley asked, glee in his tone. Yes, sir, the mercenary replied. Missing part of his shoulder, but alive. Wanted some direction before terminating him. Good, Mosley replied. We're in a neighborhood a few miles away. Have those bastards cornered. Get loaded up, and someone will talk you in. And bring our new friend along for the ride. I have some plans for him. Tate's gut sank at that, and for the first time in his life, he wished he'd been shot in the head. Chapter 2 No Name tore down the driveway towards the school, honking his horn as he moved, alerting the others that they had arrived. He drove to the side of the building next to a window before slamming on the brakes. Terrell quickly popped out, gun raised, and rushed to the front of the building, aiming towards the driveway. The others leapt out of the car, and Coleman led Kenny inside while No Name joined Terrell in aiming. They stood there for several seconds, waiting for what they had assumed was an inevitable assault. But it didn't arrive. As much as I would love to think that ambush went off without a hitch, 
I think we should assume they're still out there. No name said dryly. Before Tyrell could respond, the chopper blades echoed in the distance. The sounds seemed to get lower to the ground, and then slowed down. You know them better than I do, Tyrell said, puffing out his cheeks and letting out a deep breath. What do you think? No name tongued his cheek. They know they have us cornered, he said. So if it were me, I would regroup and set the stage for an assault. Guess that means we should get ready to repel one, then, the captain said firmly, and No Name nodded, following him inside the school and locking the door behind them. When they walked in, the group all stood in the entrance, except for one. Where is Miles? Tyrell asked, looking around. Ace pointed up. He's on the roof, the redneck replied, staying out of sight. Tyrell motioned for the walkie-talkie in Ace's hand, and he handed it over. The captain raised his to his mouth and clicked the button. "'How's it looking up there, bud?' he asked. "'All quiet on the western front, Cap,' Miles replied immediately. "'But given that helicopter I just saw land a few blocks over, I'm guessing that's not going to be the case for very long.' Terrell nodded. "'You're right about that,' he said. "'What's the opposition?' Miles asked. Fifteen men, give or take,' Terrell nodded, glancing at No Name, who nodded in agreement. And that chopper, it's got a fifty cal on it, which is going to mean trouble. Well, we got those woods on the perimeter booby-trapped up pretty good, so if they do a head-on assault, they're going to have a bad day, Miles replied. Terrell nodded. If they find them, then it should buy us a little time while they bypass them, he said. What do you want me to do, Cap? Miles asked. Hang tight a sec, Terrell replied, and then turned to fully face No Name. You have an abundance of snipers in your outfit? he asked. The bold mercenary tilted his head back and forth. Got a handful, he admitted. I think it's safe to say that Mosley would have brought one or two along with him. This keeps getting better and better, Tyrell muttered, and then raised the radio to his mouth. You stay out of sight. Good chance the enemy has snipers, so if you do expose yourself, don't do it for very long. Yes, sir, Miles replied. I'm under some cover now, but I can see the tree line. I'll let you know when I see movement. Good man, Tyrell replied, and tossed the radio back to Ace before addressing the group. They're going to be coming at us hard, so we need to be ready. What's the status here? Windows on the front and sides of the building are secure, or at least as secure as they're going to get, Lily reported. Tyrell nodded. And the gym? he asked. Doors are locked, but not chained, she replied. Figured we might need a way out and didn't want to limit our options. No Name took a deep breath. I'm guessing there's no other road out of here, he asked. Nah, it's just dense woods for a couple hundred yards and then the water, Ace explained, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Although, if you want to swim for it... No Name pursed his lips. If we try to run on foot, they'll pick us off easily, he said. And we run the risk of having to fight zombies as well. So you thinking we need to make our stand here? Terrell asked. The bold mercenary nodded. I think this is going to be our best bet at survival, he replied. If we can take them out, it'll buy us time to escape before reinforcements arrive. Kemp raised his hand. Commander, I have an idea, he said. Let's hear it, No Name said, turning to his second. They're staging in a neighborhood, Kemp replied. Plenty of places to hide out there. If a couple of us can get through the lines without tripping the booby traps, we can flank them. Maybe pull some pressure off of you guys here. Coleman? Terrell asked, turning to his sniper. I set some of the traps on the east side, Coleman replied. I can get us through. No name nodded. Kemp, head out with him, he instructed. Raise some hell. The duo grabbed their gear and headed out the side exit of the school, staying out of sight. What about the rest of us? Lily piped up. Terrell turned back to the group, squaring his shoulders. We're going to have to lock this place down and hope those two maniacs can take some out, he replied. What do you think? He cocked his head at no name. Civilians on defense, us on offense? Probably our only chance, the bold mercenary agreed. Lily bristled. Hey, she snapped. We can fight. I have no doubt that you can, no name amended, raising his palms. But frankly, it's a miracle that you've lasted as long as you have. That's not a knock against you, however. She crossed her arms. Kind of feels like one, she grumbled. Dante pulled her against his side. He's right, hun, he said quietly. 
We've been very fortunate up to this point. Lily nodded begrudgingly, and Grace blinked at them, pointing her finger between them rapidly. Oh, if we survive this, y'all got some explaining to do, she said, pretending to be offended. Lily and Dante laughed sheepishly, and then her gaze hardened. As long as you treat him well, Grace declared, pointing to Lily. Before the woman could open her mouth, Dante gave her shoulder an affectionate squeeze. She does, he said, kissing the top of her head. Grace smiled warmly, meeting No Name's eyes for a split second before turning back to Terrell. The colour in her cheeks since she'd been reunited with her brother had been evident and palpable, and he was going to do everything he could to make sure she got to continue living alongside him. You two, cover the gym, Terrell was saying to Hawk and Eddie. Straight down the hall on the left. Got it, Hawk said, and he and Eddie grabbed their gear and ran off towards the gym. Terrell turned to Dante. Love birds, eastern classrooms, he said, and Gray stepped forward. I'm going with them, she declared. Terrell shook his head. Need two-man teams, he said. She raised an eyebrow. But we have an odd number, she said, whirling a hand around her head. The captain looked around and then sighed, chuckling to himself. Well, shit, he sighed. They don't teach counting in Delta? No name teased, raising an amused eyebrow. Yeah, yeah, Terrell said, waving him off, and then glanced at Grace. Go with them, he agreed. The trio headed off to the eastern wall and he returned to the rednecks. Ace, Maddox, you're on the western wall, Terrell instructed. Oh, we're gonna have some fun, buddy, Ace exclaimed, smacking his partner on the shoulder. I got some big old sparkler bombs set up for those fuckers. Maddox simply grunted. His lips downturned and tightened his grip on his metal baseball bat. Before they could move, however, a squeal echoed outside. Attention, attention! Mosley's voice came through a bullhorn, and No Name's blood turned to ice. If everyone in the class would please take their seats, the assembly is about to begin. Terrell led the group to the front doors, No Name next to him, and they drew their weapons as they inched open the doors wide enough so that everyone could see outside. Mosley stood at the tree line standing in the middle of the driveway, about a hundred and fifty yards away. He waved as the doors moved, catching that he was being watched. No other mercenaries were visible, even covertly as No Name scanned the trees. I know I've never met this asshole, Terrell muttered, but he seems to be enjoying this a little too much. No Name snorted. Sociopaths would look at him and suggest he tone it down, he said dryly. Fantastic, Terrell drew out the word, sarcasm evident in his tone. Oh, I see the door has cracked open a bit, Mosley said into the horn. So kind of you all to join us. Now, I'm not going to ramble on for too long, seeing as how we still have a lot to get to today but there is something that needs to be addressed. He motioned to the trees behind him, and a moment later a mercenary shoved Tate out into the sunlight. His arms were cuffed behind his back, his whole left side bloody. He staggered towards Mosley, and Maddox growled, pushing forward. Ace and Kenny got a grip on him, and his bat clattered to the floor as he tried to get out of their grip. Now... I know you had high hopes for your little ambush, Mosley continued, but it didn't pan out like you wanted. In fact, your friend here took more damage than any of my men, so you sacrificed him for nothing. We have to do something, Maddox cried. Terrell and No Name exchanged a concerned look, but neither had any ideas to voice. Cap, I have a shot. Miles's voice came through the radio. Do I have the green light? Yes, Maddox cried. Tell him yes! Terrell looked at the bold mercenary. Would it give him a chance? He asked. No name shook his head. He's got two guns on him, guaranteed, he explained. You have to give him a chance, Maddox snarled. Terrell gripped the walkie-talkie tightly, swallowing hard. Negative, he said. Stand down. You motherfucker! Maddox roared, and Ace and Kenny strained to hold him back. 
Terrell turned away from him towards the door, focusing on Mosley, and No Name stepped back into his line of vision, hoping that being a neutral party would get through to the redneck. If Miles shoots, there's a good chance he gets put down, he explained. I'm sorry about your friend. There's nothing we can do. Maddox yelled and tore himself away from Kenny and Ace, but this time backwards, walking down the hallway a bit. He paused in front of a glass trophy case and swung his bat several times into it, shattering it. Trophies crashed to the floor, and No Name shook his head with remorse, but turned back to the task at hand. So, here we are, Mosley continued casually. Time to dole out some punishment for your transgressions. Now, normally, I'm not too heavy-handed when it comes to punishment. On any other day, I might give this young man detention. However, seeing as how this is hardly his first offense, I'm going to have to opt for something a bit more dramatic. He paused for effect. Expulsion. He raised a handgun and fired at Tate, blowing out the back of his head. As his body crumpled to the ground and Maddox raged even harder behind them, Mosley raised the horn again. Take a good look, he bellowed. You did this to him, he waved his gun with a flourish. And soon, this is going to be you. He tossed the bullhorn on the ground like a mic drop and then sauntered back into the tree line. Terrell slammed the front door of the school. Jesus, fuck, that dude is out of his mind, Ace exclaimed. No name swallowed hard. Understatement, he agreed. What's their most likely course of action? Terrell asked, turning to him. The bold mercenary took a deep breath. Multiple teams, breaching in multiple places, he said. Front door? Terrell asked. Most likely, although they're not going to just knock, No Name replied. The captain nodded. Explosives? he asked. It's what I would do, No Name agreed. They don't have the element of surprise, so all bets are off. Nico stepped forward. I have an idea for that, he said, and rummaged around in his bag before pulling out something that resembled a homemade claymore mine. There was a motion sensor on the front of it that looked like it had been ripped off of a garage light. Terrell's brow furrowed. I'm almost afraid to ask, he said. Oh, don't be afraid, young man, Nico drawled, wagging a finger at him. This is my personal design, not something an amateur should attempt. He pulled out a remote, wiggling it in the air. One click of this button and it arms. Once it is armed, the next thing that crosses its path is a very, very bad day. No name blinked at him in awe. Can it withstand an explosion? he asked. No name smirked. Might want to set it back a few yards from the door, but as soon as they detonate theirs, he twirled the detonator around in his hand dramatically, I are mine. Set it up, Terrell said immediately. Kenny, you cover him, no name instructed, and the two of them moved towards the front door as Ace led a still raging Maddox to wander off to their post. Once everyone was gone, and it was the mercenary and the soldier, no name felt the question before it even came out of the captain's mouth. What kind of odds do you give us? Terrell asked quietly. The bold mercenary scrunched up his face and thought for a moment. Eh, forty percent, he asked. The captain chuckled. That's not bad for you and me, but what about for everybody else? He asked. Ten percent more than the two of us getting out of this in one piece, No Name said with a sigh. Well, I've faced longer odds, Terrell said, swiping his palms against each other. The bold mercenary shook his head. Likewise, he agreed, but I'm still never a fan of them. Hey, at least you were getting that private contractor mercenary money, Terrell said, clapping him on the shoulder. No Name rolled his eyes. And here I was thinking you Delta boys were smart, he drawled. The captain chuckled. Stick around, and I'll be happy to dispel that myth, he said. They shared a short laugh, and then ready their weapons to patrol the halls. The assault could start at any moment, and they had to be ready at the drop of a hat. Chapter 3 
Coleman led Kemp through the woods a few hundred yards to the side of the main driveway. As they moved through cautiously, he stopped them, pointing out a thin wire about ankle high. The two of them carefully stepped over it, continuing on towards the neighborhood. They reached the edge of the woods, taking a knee and surveying the situation. Back towards the edge of the driveway, they could see a few mercenaries gearing up for an assault, but couldn't see Mosley. They could, however, hear his voice through a bullhorn, a voice full of malice and venom. He seems like a real charmer, Coleman muttered. Kemp wrinkled his nose. If you think this is bad, imagine being stuck in a desert with him for months on end, he said. Pretty sure I'd rather take a bullet to the face, Coleman quipped. A gunshot went off in Mosley's direction, and the sniper shook his head at the unfortunate timing. Next time, I'll ask for some hookers and blow, he said. Kem chuckled. Good call, he agreed. They looked out at the driveway, spotting the mercenaries by the edge of the woods walking down it, presumably to meet up with Mosley. Go, Coleman hissed, and the duo took off like a shot towards the house. Their boot falls were muffled by the grass, and they reached the edge of the building unscathed, with Kemp aiming his weapon towards the front and Coleman looking back to make sure they hadn't been spotted. They were in the clear, and the sniper gave him a thumbs up. As Coleman stood guard, Kemp got to work on getting a window open. He slid his knife through the slit between the top and bottom of the glass, flicking open the lock and gently opening it up. They scrambled inside with no fear of anything in the house, considering the area had been cleared a long while ago. They kept their voices low as they approached the front of the house and took a knee by the windows, looking out through the blinds towards the mercenaries. From their vantage point, they could see four men standing around readying their weapons. A few moments later, two more came up to join them, all of them just hanging out and awaiting orders. "'Anybody over there you care about?' Coleman asked quietly. Kemp shook his head. Not particularly, he admitted. I got really tight with the commander while we were overseas. Been in a few tight jams with him and he got us out. Anything this bad? Coleman asked, cocking a brow. Kemp sighed. This one is top five for sure, he said. Kind of surprising with the tough spots that you didn't end up close with anybody else you served with, the sniper said. And Kemp could almost feel his prodding as if it were physical. I had an incident back in my military days, he explained softly. We were in some godforsaken place doing something that I'm sure mattered to a suit on the other side of the planet, but didn't make a bit of damn difference to those of us on the ground. Operation went fine, we got in, eliminated the target, just another day at the office. He took a deep breath. Heading out, though, was a different story. IED detonated before we were even off the block. Shredded the lead vehicle like it was a tin can. Lost six men. Six friends. He ground his teeth for a moment. In the blink of an eye, they were just... gone. After that, I became kind of numb to the people I served with. Figured it was easier than dealing with that feeling again. Coleman nodded thoughtfully. No judgment here, man, he said gently. Lost a few friends along the way. It's never easy. Ever since then, my biggest concern was doing whatever was necessary so that I saw another day, Kemp continued wistfully. Even though I served with several of those men over there, that's still the only thing I care about. Plus, they're working with Mosley, which means they're of the same mind as him. So, good riddance. Works for me, Coleman said with a shrug. Just wanted to check to see where your head is at. Kemp nodded. If I was in your shoes, I would have done the exact same thing he assured him. The two gave each other a professional nod and then looked back up at the mercenaries. The group had grown to ten when Mosley walked up with a few more in tow. The lead prick barked out orders before giving the signal for the helicopter to start up. Coleman pulled out his walkie-talkie, making sure the volume was as low as it could go. Cap, you copy? he asked. What's the situation? Tyrell asked. Kemp and I are in striking position, he explained. Chopper is powering up and the troops are getting into position. Looks like it's going to be go time very soon. You two going to be able to cause some trouble? Terrell asked. Coleman smirked. You haven't known me not to? He shot back. If you need something, shout, the captain replied. Copy that, the sniper said, 
and pocketed the radio. The two men watched the mercenaries break away into groups, a trio of men moving quickly in their direction. When they were most of the way to their hiding spot, the mercenaries turned down beside a house and headed towards the woods. Guess we went a little wide, Coleman said, and they got to their feet running back through the house. They jumped out the window they'd gone in through and ran around the back, watching as the mercenaries readied their weapons before slowly moving into the woods. Once they'd cleared the threshold and disappeared into the leaves, Coleman and Kemp began their move. They ran through the grass, stopping two houses up from their target's position. They prepared to make a move, but before they could go, an explosion popped off in the distance, forcing them back behind cover. One of your booby traps? Kemp asked. Coleman nodded. Sounds like it, he said. Our boys should be smart enough to figure that out, which means they're going to be going slow. Kemp explained. The sniper pulled out a large knife, twirling it around his fingers with a grin. It also means they're going to be very forward-focused, he said. So let's see what we can do. Kemp nodded and pulled out his own knife, handgun in his offhand just in case. They crept up to the edge of the woods, looking into them but not seeing the mercenaries due to the trees. They listened carefully and heard movement up ahead. Coleman looked down and spotted the indentation of the boots on the forest floor and motioned for Kemp to look and then follow him. They moved slowly, matching the mercenaries' footsteps so they didn't step on any branches to alert them. About fifteen yards into the trees, they could see the mercenaries moving. One of them laid on the ground, trying to defuse a bomb, while the second one stood very still. Kemp realized it was because the man's foot had hit a tripwire, and managed to stop himself from going any further, but was too afraid to step back in case it was caught. The third mercenary was about ten yards behind them, keeping his attention towards the front, on high alert. Coleman motioned towards the guard and Kemp nodded. The sniper carefully moved up, knife in hand, towards the unaware mercenary, and took up position behind a tree a few yards away. He struck, leaping out from behind cover. The couple of footsteps gained the guard's attention, but he turned around just in time to catch a knife to the throat. His gurgling death alerted the defusing mercenary, and he whipped his head around to see what was happening. Coleman dove back behind the tree as Kemp whipped his knife at the man entangled in the tripwire. The blade embedded itself into his shoulder, and while it wasn't a kill shot, it made him lurch forward, moving the wire just enough to trigger the device. The bomb detonated, sending ball bearings in every direction, ripping into the mercenary and sending him to the ground in a heap. The one who had been defusing the bomb avoided the majority of the shrapnel and shook his head back and forth as if his ears were ringing. As he reached for his gun, Coleman was on him, punching him in the face to stagger him backwards. As the mercenary recovered and made another move for his weapon, Coleman struck again, this time with his blade. He used his speed and momentum to get it underneath his opponent's jaw, going up through his mouth and embedding it into the bottom of his brain. The man convulsed for a moment before the life silently left his eyes. As the body hit the ground, the sniper turned around and looked for Kemp. You good? he asked. Good, the mercenary replied, stepping out of the bushes and raising his knife. In the distance a torrent of gunfire erupted, as well as the chopper blades whirling overhead, and a few moments later the telltale cracks of a fifty cal machine gun opened up. Come on, they're going to need our help, Coleman said, and he and Kemp rushed back behind the tree line. The mercenary's blood pounded in his ears as they moved as quickly as they could hoping and praying that they could get to the next group and flank them before it was too late. Chapter 4 Dante, Grace, and Lily were in a classroom on the eastern side of the building. They were spread out, keeping their eyes peeled towards the woods, which were about eighty yards away. They each had a gun, Dante holding an assault rifle, and the other two brandishing handguns, but so far there was no movement. So, Grace drawled playfully, how long has this been going on? Dante smirked. Couple of weeks now, he said. His sister shook her head and chuckled. Like, seriously, she said, you've been single for years, and then as soon as the zombie apocalypse hits, you find yourself a girlfriend? Well, my mama always told me that when the right one comes along, you latch onto them and hold on tight, Lily declared. Of course, 
She meant literally forget my birth control and get knocked up, but I took the spirit of the suggestion to heart. Grace shot her brother a concerned look, and he shook his head no, but then paused. It is no, right? he asked, glancing down at Lily's belly. Oh, hell yeah, it's a no, hun, she replied with a laugh. I didn't want kids back when there were doctors and drugs and shit. It's a definite no now. Okay, so no, we're good, Dante said to Grace. How did you two even meet? she asked, shaking her head. Dante pursed his lips for a moment. Well, remember when I jumped off of the bridge with Bailey? he asked. Yeah, she replied, and he internally sighed. Of course she remembered when he abandoned her. As if sensing his train of thought, she put a gentle hand on his arm. Yeah? she prompted. We managed to swim over to an island where Lily and a couple of her co-worker friends were, he explained. Been sticking together ever since. Lily bumped his arm playfully. We've even saved each other's lives a few times along the way, she added. Not like either one of us set out for this to happen, Dante said softly. It just kind of did. He smiled down at his woman. She smiled up at him and then met Grace's eyes. We never stopped working to get you back, though, she said firmly. We were always out there trying to figure out how to get you off that island. So you were fighting side by side with him to get me out of there? Grace asked. Dante nodded. Yeah, she was, he assured her. All right, you're good in my book, Grace said, waving them off. Although, whenever we get settled somewhere, I want to be sleeping on the opposite side of the house as you two. There are some things more horrific than the walking dead. The couple shared a look, and Lily drew her bottom lip between her teeth, a devilish smirk coming over her face. It was all Dante could do not to reach over and thread his fingers through her hair. Hey, stop it right now, Grace scolded. We have to focus. As if on cue, an explosion popped from outside and the trio stiffened, readying their weapons. Looks like they found some of those booby traps, Dante murmured, and then a moment later three mercenaries came running out of the woods, heading straight towards their window. Wait until they get closer to fire, he instructed. We have to make every bullet count. The women flanked him and waited, aiming downrange. He stood in the middle of the window, his rifle at the ready. When the mercenaries were about forty yards away, one of them skidded to a stop and started yelling, and all three of them took a knee and started shooting. Down! Dante screamed and looked back and forth to make sure both women hit the deck fast enough. Stay down! he cried, and then popped up, opening fire and sending three round bursts towards the enemy. This forced all three mercenaries to drop their stomachs in the grass. They continued firing, and just as he dove back to the floor, he noticed one of them barking into a walkie-talkie. When I give the signal, everybody get up and fire, Dante said, and Grace and Lily nodded in agreement as he listened hard to the gunshots outside. Finally there was a break, and he barked. Now! The trio popped up and took aim, but before they could fire a single shot, the chopper crested the tree line like an eagle stalking its prey. Run! Dante bellowed as the helicopter swooped over the mercenaries and spun around so that the 50 cal machine gun faced them. They took off, headed towards the school hallway and made it about halfway across the room before the gunner opened fire. The cinder blocks on the outer wall of the school exploded as bullets ripped through them. Because the chopper fired from an elevated position, the bullets penetrated the ground instead of straight ahead, allowing the trio to get to safety. Dante reached the door first, shoving Lily and Grace through before exiting himself. They hurtled across the hallway, hunkering down against the far side as Terrell and No Name raced towards them. What the hell is going on? the captain demanded. Fifty cal on the chopper is taking out the wall, Dante said, motioning with his gun towards the classroom. No Name poked his head inside, and then quickly ducked back out as debris flew around. He readied his weapon and took position next to the doorframe. How many are out there? he asked. Got three about forty yards out, Dante said. They're going to get inside, No Name replied. It wasn't a question or amusing, it was a fact. I'm more worried about that chopper, Terrell admitted. Until that thing is knocked out, we're not going to have a chance. Just then, the firing outside stopped and they listened hard as the helicopter moved, the blades sounding like they were at the front of the building. They're going for the front door, No Name said. Terrell nodded towards him. You got this? he asked. 
The bold mercenary pointed to Dante. Yeah, I got this, he said, going to need your help. Dante nodded and turned to Lily and Grace. Get to the gym, he instructed. If there is a clear path to the trees, you get the others and go. I'm not leaving you, his sister shot back. Lily jerked a thumb at Grace. I'm with her, she declared. Dante grimaced, but he knew there was no time to argue as No Name opened fire around the corner into the classroom they'd been in. Fine, he said through gritted teeth, but you stay with the others in the gym. Now go. The girls took off running towards the gym, and Dante launched himself into a slide across the doorway to the opposite corner to No Name. He popped in to help shoot, surveying the three-yard-wide hole that had been blasted into the cinder block wall. Two mercenaries were on either side of the hole, firing towards them, and Dante narrowly missed hitting one of them in the head before a grenade bounced into the classroom. His eye locked on it as it lobbed in, and he barely heard no names yelled, GRENADE! before they both lunged away from the door in opposite directions. The explosion racked the ground, sending debris everywhere, and heat flew over his head. The fire thankfully missed Dante, and as soon as it receded he scrambled to his feet as No Name slid along the ground, firing into the room. Dante swung in just in time to see the bold mercenary clip one of their enemies in the chest with his assault rifle, knocking him back but not killing him due to the bulletproof vest casing his torso. He didn't waste time, firing at head height, missing the other two mercenaries but forcing them back behind cover. A barrage of bullets came back at them, and No Name and Dante ducked back out into the hallway, behind the cinder block wall. Boot falls thundered on the classroom floor as the mercenaries darted for them, but it was clear they were spread out, one after the other, from the sound. Dante braced himself as the first one darted into the hallway, rifle slung over his shoulder, and handgun aimed directly at his head. Dante knocked his opponent's arm to the side as he fired, narrowly missing him. The mercenary pushed forward with a jab that Dante deflected, but it drove him away from the classroom as No Name leapt into action. No Name jumped into the doorway, gun raised. The second mercenary was only a couple of yards away, and the bold man beat him to the punch, pulling the trigger and catching him in the vest, stunning him long enough for No Name to rush into the room. There was debris everywhere, the classroom in a flaming wreckage from the fifty cal and the grenade. He snatched the mercenary by the vest and drove him backwards, using him as a shield as the third and final mercenary opened fire towards them, still laying on the ground. A bullet hit No Name's charge in the chest as they struggled, but the bold mercenary continued to hold him up, the man on the ground scrambling to his feet to get a better angle, and No Name reacted fast. In a swift movement, he shoved his opponent back and drew his own handgun with expert grace and speed, putting a bullet between the shoved man's eyes before he could even react. Blood splattered out the back of his head, coating the man behind him in crimson. The still-standing opponent screamed and pushed forward, firing blindly with his handgun as he frantically wiped at his eyes, smearing blood all over his face. No Name tried to get off a shot, but he missed, and the mercenary was on him quickly. The impact of the two large men colliding knocked their weapons from their hands as they grappled backwards. No Name whirled and brought his elbow down on the back of his opponent's head, causing him to loosen his grip around his waist. He hit him again before grabbing his vest and wrenching him free of his body, slinging him across the room. The mercenary flipped over, landing on a pile of flaming rubble, and the fire was intense enough that the back of his vest caught, and he clawed at it before ripping it free and tossing it inside. He sniffed and adjusted his stance, raising his fists. Heard stories about you, he snarled as he raked his eyes over No Name. Gonna enjoy being your last chapter. No Name didn't give him the satisfaction of responding, simply darted forward to start swinging. He came in with a right hook that the other blocked and then brought his left fist up, but it was deflected. He knew how to fight, but Theo's men were highly trained mercenaries. If they weren't also tough as nails and good at killing, they wouldn't work for QXR. No Name managed to deflect his opponent's attacks, maneuvering backwards in a deadly dance to catch his breath from the offensive. Finally, he caught an opening, managing to sneak a punch through the mercenary's defences and catch him in the gut. From the oof that came out of the man's lungs, no Name knew he'd taken a bit of air out of him from the gut punch. The mercenary tried to throw another punch, but it didn't have much power behind it as the man struggled to breathe, and No Name took his advantage, grabbing his opponent's wrist and throwing him off balance. He kicked him in the small of his back and sent him tumbling to the ground towards the giant hole in the wall. 
He pulled himself up, but before he could get to his feet, a gunshot cracked in the distance, and his face exploded in an array of blood and bone. No name dove for cover, staying out of the line of sight of the hole. He jerked a walkie-talkie from his pocket and mashed the button. Sniper confirmed! Sniper confirmed! He barked into the speaker, and then shoved the radio back into his pocket as he launched for the door. He grabbed his fallen handgun as he went. Leaping into the hallway, he spotted Dante on the ground with his own opponent, locked up in a very uncomfortable-looking armbar. Come on! Snap for me! Dante snarled, and then there was a horrific crack as he broke the mercenary's arm in two. He kicked the screaming man off of him and rolled out of the way so that no name could pop the mercenary in the head and end his misery. The bold man leaned down to help Dante to his feet. You good? he asked. Dante nodded. Yeah, you? he asked, retrieving his rifle from the floor. Had a little help taking out that last one, no name explained. Sniper got him. Dante furrowed his brow. Why did his own sniper shoot him? he asked. No name shrugged. He didn't have his vest on, so I guess he got confused for one of us, he mused. Well, I'll take the help, even if it is unintentional, Dante replied. The fifty cal erupted again, and they both turned to see Terrell tearing down the hallway, fire and debris scattering from the front door as it was destroyed by bullets. We have got to take that chopper out, No Name muttered, and grabbed his walkie-talkie. Does anybody have a shot in that helicopter? he asked into the receiver. Anything will do at this point. Miles lay on the roof of the building, hiding from everyone on the ground. He stayed concentrating on the tree line, having been trying in vain to find the source of the sniper shot that had recently fired. He'd heard the shot and no name's cry, but hadn't seen where it came from. The fifty cow laid waste to the front, and he winced. He didn't have a clear view of the chopper, not from his vantage point, and he couldn't move unless he wanted a bullet to the face. Miles felt helpless. If he could find that sniper, then he'd be able to help, but the trees were too dense. Does anybody have a shot in that helicopter? No Name's voice came through the radio. Anything will do at this point. Miles clenched his jaw. If I could fucking move, I could have a shot, he thought, and waited diligently, listening to each of the others responding through the speaker in the negative. Nobody had a shot. Nobody had even come close to a shot. He waffled briefly, warring in his head. As soon as he popped up from cover, that sniper would pick him off quickly. But if that helicopter wasn't dealt with, none of them would have a chance. The whole mission would be moot, and they would have gotten innocent civilians off of that island just for everyone to die. He took a deep breath and pressed the button on the walkie-talkie. Miles here, he said firmly. I can take it out. Don't you dare! Terrell cried, gunfire echoing in the background. That sniper is going to pop you quick! Good thing I'm a quick shot. Miles replied. He'd known his captain would protest, but he knew what had to be done. It's been a pleasure, Cap. He set down the walkie-talkie, not needing it any more. Miles, don't do it! Terrell yelled, but Miles was already checking the ammo on his rifle, making sure it was loaded and ready to go. Damn it! Doesn't anybody else have a shot? The captain cried desperately. He took a few deep breaths, knowing that they would most likely be his last. He got his bearings on the helicopter off to his right. It had stopped firing the machine gun just hovering above the ground. A few moments later, a loud explosion racked the building, and he took advantage of the distraction. Miles! Terrell yelled. He popped up and aimed, targeting the pilot within a millisecond and pulling the trigger. He had just enough time for the bullet to leave the gun before he was suddenly gasping for breath, his throat on fire. Miles collapsed to the ground, holding the wound on his neck, blood water falling from him and quickly coating his chest with blood. He felt almost floaty, the pain far away, the stickiness of his shirt, the brightness of the sun, the echo of his captain still yelling to see if he was all right. He watched the helicopter spin out of control, and a smile traced across his face, the gunner holding on for dear life as the beastly machine fell to the ground. A moment later, a gigantic fireball flashed into the air, smoke rising, and Miles closed his eyes, letting himself float away, knowing he did what had to be done. Doesn't anybody else have a shot? Terrell yelled into his radio, and No Name's heart thumped in his ears. He knew what it was like. 
He knew what the captain was feeling, that he didn't want to lose his man. He would feel the same way if it were Kemp up there, offering to sacrifice himself. But it would be their only chance, and he wasn't going to waste the opportunity. I need a spotter, No Name said, inclining his head to Dante. Follow me. He led them back into the classroom, hugging the right side of the room, and staying low to avoid being in the sights of the enemy sniper. He grabbed an assault rifle from the floor and they crawled out into the relative shadow of debris so they could safely see out. It's going to be subtle, No Name said as he scanned the tree line. Look for any sudden movements as soon as he shoots. Got it, Dante agreed. They waited with bated breath and then the front of the building exploded and seconds later there was a crack of a sniper rifle and then another. One o'clock, Dante barked. Ten feet up. No Name adjusted his aim. Seeing slight movement in a tree, he pulled the trigger, sending a few three-round bursts in that direction. A moment later, the branches moved significantly, and a black blur fell with a thump to the ground. The two men stared hard at the area downrange, No Name's gaze piercing, to make sure that there wasn't anything else. No more movement. Finally, after several seconds, his shoulders relaxed. Miles! Status! Terrell demanded through the speaker. No name picked up his walkie-talkie, hitting the button. Sniper down, he declared. He wasn't sure if anybody could hear it, with the intense amount of gunfire coming from the other side of the school. I can cover his entryway, Dante said as if he was reading the bold mercenary's thoughts. You go help them. No name nodded, getting up and taking off towards all of the noise. Chapter 5 Kemp and Coleman heard the fifty cal in the distance, laying waste to the school building. They ran along the first street in the neighborhood, trying to get to the other flank to help out. Suddenly, squealing tires echoed in the distance, and Coleman veered to the left, leading Kemp to cover. Reinforcements? the mercenary asked. You tell me, Coleman replied with a shrug. Your boy's that quick to respond? Kemp cocked his head. If they left Hilton Head about the same time as Mosley took flight... They'd be getting here right about now, he said. Coleman swallowed hard. And what standard deployment in a situation like this, he asked, though he was sure he didn't want to know the answer. Two vehicles, eight men, Kemp replied. The sniper wrinkled his nose. Peachy, he said dryly. Little crossfire on the lead vehicle and hope for the best, the mercenary asked. Fuck it, Coleman agreed, holding up his rifle. Good enough for me. Kemp nodded and darted across the street, disappearing into a house. Coleman did the same on his side of the street, taking position in a shattered window to wait. He readied his rifle and waited for the SUVs to come into view. The engines grew louder and louder until a vehicle came into view a few blocks away. A second swerved in behind it, and that seemed to be it. So Kemp had been on point with his deployment estimate. He waited until the lead vehicle was about a half a block away, and then opened fire. Kemp followed suit from his vantage point, and they concentrated their fire on the engine, quickly ripping it to shreds and sending metal debris everywhere. A few shots migrated up from the hood, shattering the glass and hitting the men in the front seat. The SUV swerved violently, spinning out in a yard and smacking hard into a tree. Coleman attempted to hit the second one, but it sped past them. He broke from his position at the front of the house and raced to the back, throwing open the patio door and hoping to get a shot at them. But rather than stop, the SUV continued towards the school. As it vanished behind the tree line, there was a loud explosion in the distance and a plume of thick black smoke rose into the air. Guess they got the chopper, he murmured, and shook his head. They were on foot and couldn't do anything about the SUV at the moment. At the sound of gunfire, he rushed outside and around the house, away from the street. As he came around, he spotted two men from the crashed vehicle using it for cover, and firing towards Kemp's location. He double-checked his ammo, making sure he had most of the magazine left. Coleman moved quietly and quickly to flank the SUV and then took aim, opening fire quickly to take out the two mercenaries from behind. We're clear, he yelled, and approached the bodies to snatch up their spare magazines. Kemp raced over from the other house, circling the vehicle. Coleman tossed him a few magazines and jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Come on, that other SUV didn't even bother to pump the brakes, he said, and took off running. He pumped his legs as hard as he could, Kemp keeping up next to him, 
both with guns at the ready. There could be enemies anywhere, and they had to stay on their guard. When they made it to the edge of the wooded area, they took a knee by the last set of trees before the clearing. In the distance, Coleman spotted the wrecked helicopter, as well as the front door in shambles. A force of eight mercenaries staged a breach by the front door, two of them lobbing grenades into the building. Mother of God, Coleman breathed as the grenades went off, and the men rushed inside. Chapter 6 Terrell took up position near the front door of the school, across the hall and inside a classroom for cover. On the other side of the hallway, Nico and Kenny laid in wait. Gunfire went off throughout the building as well as a helicopter spinning around outside. They're going to hit us hard, he said firmly to the others. And when... The machine gun tore through the front door, cutting him off, and they took cover as metal and stone flew everywhere. In the commotion, his walkie-talkie went off with no name calling for help on the chopper. There were a few replies he could barely hear, and then Miles came through, loud and clear. Miles here. I can take him out, he said. Terrell's blood ran cold and he snatched the walkie-talkie from his belt. Don't you dare, he barked. That sniper is going to pop you quick. Good thing I'm a quick shot, Miles replied. It's been a pleasure, Cap. Miles, don't do it, Terrell cried. Damn it! He looked up at the ceiling, or the heavens. He didn't know. Does anybody else have a shot? The machine gun fire stopped and then the telltale crack of a sniper rifle sounded, followed by a second, and then a horrific noise coming from the helicopter. A few moments later, it crashed hard into the ground, sending a fireball up into the air. Miles! Status! he demanded. But deep in his gut, he knew that second shot had been from the enemy, and one to end his friend's life. All he could do was hope it was quick. In this moment, he needed to put his emotions aside or else his companion's death would be for nothing. He looked to the front door where a trio of mercenaries were trying to breach the hole. Terrell fired several three-round bursts, sending them back behind cover, popping out to return fire. Nico! the captain barked, nodding across the hall. Nico raised his hand and hit a button on his remote, waving to signal he had armed the device that was still in position. Terrell waited and a split second later it detonated sending metal ball bearings through the air towards the entrance. One man fell to the ground convulsing, while the other two retreated. Sniper down, No Name said through the walkie-talkie, and Terrell let out a deep breath. They're not going to be gone for long, he said, addressing Nico and Kenny. I want you to fall back to the gym. I can help with my gun, Nico said, raising his weapon. Terrell nodded. I know you can, but if they come at us with force, we're going to be in the gym not too long after you he insisted. Come on, Captain, he's right, Kenny said, tugging on Nico's arm. Let the pros handle it. Nico huffed. I am a professional, he declared, but I respect your wishes. He nodded to Terrell. Be safe, my friend. The two broke off down the hallway and Terrell turned to aim back towards what was left of the front door. No name appeared seconds later, taking Nico and Kenny's position across the hall and aimed towards the smoldering hall. Sorry about your friend, the bold mercenary said tightly. Terrell nodded in thanks. Sounds like you got the bastard, though, he said. Can't confirm it was a kill, No Name admitted, but he fell out of a tree. Terrell swallowed hard. As long as he's not shooting at us anymore, I'll take it, he said. They held their positions waiting for the inevitable strike. The front door was across a hallway running along the front of the building, and Terrell cocked his head as No Name raised a hand. Cover me, the bold mercenary requested. I'm going to get to one of those other hallway classrooms. Go left, the captain replied. I'm pretty sure Maddox and Asa are to the right. He watched No Name break into a sprint in his periphery, keeping his eyes focused on the front door. When he reached the top of the hallway, a hand on each side appeared, and two grenades bounced into the building. Shit, 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 No Name bellowed, and Terrell caught a glimpse of him diving into a classroom just as he ducked back behind cover hoping the bold mercenary would be okay. Immediately after, he popped out and opened fire, but two teams of four broke into the building, quickly pinning him down with their own barrage of bullets. Move up, Mosley's voice echoed, and the first team of four passed the classroom no name was in. Once Mosley's team came into range, a bullet flew into one of his team members' legs, 
The remaining three whipped towards No Name's classroom, opening fire on him. Move back, move back, Mosley barked and backed up into the first classroom on the outer wall, diving in with his trio following, the last one posting himself in the doorway to fire back towards No Name. The first group of four that had passed him closed in on Terrell, and he slammed the door shut, running to the back of the room and taking cover behind the large metal teacher's desk. He kept his sights trained on the door, waiting for it to be breached. It didn't take long before somebody kicked it right off of the hinges and lobbed a grenade inside. His eyes widened and he ducked behind the desk, thankfully providing sufficient cover as shrapnel and debris flew everywhere. He popped up as soon as it was able, opening fire and forcing the four mercenaries right back into the hallway. Yeah, you'll better think twice before coming in here, he bellowed, his heart thumping in his ears. Chapter 7 As the two different firefights continued, remaining more or less at a stalemate, Maddox and Ace sat in the classroom across from the one Mosley was in. The door was cracked slightly open, and it was dark inside, so they could see out, but remain hidden. Maddox gently bumped Ace's shoulder. You still have that sparkler bomb? he asked quietly, a plan formulating in his mind. Ace nodded and pulled out one that was a thousand count with a short sparkler on top for a fuse. Biggest one I got, he whispered back. But why? If we throw it at them, they're just going to kick it out. Maddox held up his bat. Not if I keep them in there, he said softly. You're crazy, man, Ace hissed, eyes widening. They will rip you to fucking shreds. Maddox shook his head. They're distracted and will never see me coming, he insisted. They're bunched together so I can pin them down long enough for that thing to go off. You're talking suicide, man, Ace countered. His friend let out a deep sigh. I'll get out, don't worry, he assured him. How long's that fuse? About twenty seconds, Ace replied reluctantly. Okay, as soon as I make a play for them, you light it up, Maddox said. Ace bit his lip and shook his head. But either you do it. Or I knock your ass out cold and do it myself, Maddox snarled, his gaze like steel. Those fuckers kill Tegan, and Tate, and so many others. They're going to pay right now. The rage that had been simmering in him since they'd killed Tegan had reached a boiling point when Tate had met his end, and he was sick of being told to stand down, to do nothing. Ace nodded begrudgingly. Maddox could tell that he wasn't convinced but knew better than to push him. They'd known each other long enough now, been through too much together. He needed to do this. Maddox readied himself by the door and gave Ace a nod that he was ready to go. He watched the mercenaries carefully, watching one of them finish off their magazine before swapping out for the next man up. He waited for the replacement merc to take up position and begin firing to make his move. Now, he hissed, and then threw open the door, sprinting across the hallway. The gunfire miraculously masked his footsteps, so he managed to get across without alerting the enemy. He lowered his shoulder and drove it right into the shooter's gut, driving them back into the others. All three mercenaries hit the ground and Maddox immediately swung his bat. He smacked the one closest to him in the face, shattering his nose and sending a geyser of blood flying through the air. It's all on, motherfuckers, he bellowed, and the sparkler bomb flew through the door, landing on the ground beside him. He kicked it towards the mercenaries who stared at it, confused. Maddox pulled the door shut behind him as he went to work, his chest finally feeling lighter, unleashed, finally having an outlet for his vengeance. The second mercenary tried to reload his weapon, but Maddox smashed his hand with the bat, shattering it. The gun clattered to the ground and the mercenary screamed in pain, but leapt up, putting his shoulder into Maddox's gut and driving him backwards, right into the teacher's desk. The redneck didn't quite go over, instead laying on his back as he drove the butt-end of the bat into the mercenary's forehead, causing him to stumble backwards. Maddox pulled himself up and cracked the merc on the top of the head with a brutal overhead strike, but before he could wind up again, bullet punched into his gut. You're a tough son of a bitch, I'll give you that, Mosley said with a sneer as he lowered the gun. Maddox looked down at his wound, pressing a hand against it as he staggered back against the desk. A laugh bubbled up out of his throat, and his eyes went wide, making the mercenary furrow his brow in confusion. You're about to be barbecue 
bitch, Maddox declared, more laughter maniacally bursting from him despite the pain in his belly. Mosley looked down at the sparkler bomb, and panic crossed his features when it sunk in what it was. He made a run for the windows as it went off, coating the entire room in flames. Outside the room, No Name emerged from hiding, working his way down the hallway towards the main hall. Terrell was still engaged in quite a firefight down the way with the other team of four mercenaries. Kemp and Coleman appeared in the front door, guns at the ready, and No Name blinked in surprise to see them. No time for that, however. Go help Terrell, he said shortly, motioning towards the captain. I'll get Mosley. The duo nodded and moved towards the firefight, getting into position to strike. They unloaded on the backs of the mercenaries that never saw them coming, and as No Name headed for a classroom door where smoke billowed into the hallway, he heard Coleman call for the captain, receiving an alive and well reply in return. No Name raised his gun as Ace came out from across the hall. Don't shoot, the redneck cried, hands shooting up into the air, and the bold mercenary immediately lowered his weapon. What the hell was that? he asked, inclining his head towards the burning classroom. Thousand sparkle bomb, Ace replied, swallowing hard. No name pursed his lips. Your friend? he asked. And from the crestfallen expression on the redneck's face, he was sure he already knew the answer. Ace shook his head. Inside when it went off, he said hoarsely. No name gave a nod of condolences, and then turned towards the door. He touched the knob with a fingertip quickly to make sure it wasn't burning hot, and then grabbed it, throwing the door wide open. He spotted movement in the window of the charred room, legs sliding out into the sunshine. Mosley, No Name barked, and then turned to Ace. Get the others, he instructed, and then took off running, heading out the front door and around the building to the outside of the classroom. He scanned the area for hostiles but didn't find anything, moving toward the flamed-out classroom. A still-smoking body crawled through the grass, and No Name fired a warning shot as he approached. Mosley was in rough shape. Half of his body was severely burned, his clothes still smouldering. He coughed up some blood, spitting it out on a wheeze as he looked up into the barrel of No Name's gun. Go ahead and do it, you fucking pussy, Mosley said, voice venomous but strained. Assuming you actually have the balls down there. No Name kept his gun aimed at his head, but didn't fire. You're going to have to be patient, he said. Lots of people want to crack at you. A few moments later, the survivors poured out of the school. The group quickly surrounded him, looking down at the battered and burned man as he struggled to breathe. So, this is the man who has caused so many headaches? Terrell asked, cocking his head. Hawk leaned down, eyes blazing. Who's a little bitch now, huh? He roared. Mosley looked like he was trying to spit a curse, but instead coughed from the smoke in his lungs. Wasn't sure who deserved to do the honors, no name drawled. But I had a feeling it wasn't me. Grace stepped up, pulling out her handgun and aiming it at the mercenary on the ground. At first she aimed at the head, but then pursed her lips moving the barrel up and down across his body as if contemplating her options. Go ahead, Eddie said. You can be our representative. End this douchebag. She tongued her cheek and then shook her head. No, I think we all deserve a shot, she declared, and then fired directly into Mosley's groin. The mercenary let out a howl. My rule is, that was the only headshot, Grace said with a sneer. Make it hurt. As she wandered back to her brother, Lily leaned over him, whispering loudly. I like her. She's a special one, Dante agreed, shaking his head. Glad you approve, Grace said, and gave Lily a wink before looking up at No Name, who gave her a nod. He waited patiently as the others stepped up, each aiming a gun and pointing a bullet in a different body part. Mosley laid there, whimpering in pain as he grew weaker and weaker, slowly bleeding out. Even this is less than you deserve, No Name thought to himself. But seeing this man die lifted a weight from his shoulders he hadn't realized he'd been carrying all this time. Chapter 8 The group stood around Mosley, watching him breathe his last breaths. Everyone was exhausted from the battle, still trying to process the war they'd just been through. 
The fire in the classroom began to pick up, forcing the group to move away from the building. No Name took a deep breath and looked to the captain. We can't stay here, he nodded. Terrell nodded thoughtfully. Reinforcements? he asked. If I know Theo, if he doesn't hear from Mosley, he's going to send out another crew, No Name explained. Terrell had no doubt that the bold mercenary knew what he was talking about, and nodded. Okay, everybody, listen up, he said loudly. We gotta grab what we can and go. Weapons are the biggest priority. Two minutes till we depart. Move like you have a purpose. They started moving quickly, racing into the building and scattering. They grabbed weapons from the dead mercenaries, food rations from the cafeteria. Everything they could get their hands on as smoke began to fill the hallways and billow up into the sky. Finally, after a mad dash, the remaining survivors loaded up the vehicles. Why the hell ain't we taking their vehicles? Ace grunted as he squirmed against Lily. Not like they're using them anymore. No name shook his head. GPS tracking devices, he explained. If they don't find those SUVs here, they're going to come after us. The redneck groaned and Lily pinched him as he squashed her. Fine, I'll make do, he muttered. Terrell put the vehicle in drive and punched the gas moving away. Dante, Lily, and Ace looked back at the school going up in flames. It was a good ride while it lasted, Lily said wistfully. Ace nodded. Food, shelter, seclusion, he agreed. All gone. Just means we'll have to find us another place and rebuild, Dante said, and then turned back towards the front. Not the first time fire has taken things from me. True. But without fire, you wouldn't be so pretty there, Scarface, Ace joked. So, you know, it balances out, right? To his credit, Dante chuckled at the bad attempt at a joke. Well, given your hillbilly ways, don't get too comfy sitting on your cousin there, he shot back. She's with me now. Ew, babe, Lily blurted, eyes wide and horrified. Terrell shook his head. It is amazing to me that you knucklehead survived against these mercenaries as long as you did, he declared. Well, when you have a can-do attitude and a bona fide badass like Dante here, anything is possible, Ace said. Dante shook his head. Not to mention an unimaginable amount of luck, he said. Shit, Terrell muttered. Everyone in the vehicle grew tense at another QXR SUV giving chase behind them. Hope you still have some of that luck left, Terrell said and floored the gas, speeding up as he made the turn at the first road to head towards the bridge. No Name did the same, driving the vehicle behind them. Dante, get in the back, Terrell instructed. You might have to open fire through the glass. On it, he replied, and crawled on top of the gear they had stuffed back there. Lily handed him an assault rifle once he was situated, and he watched No Name's vehicle directly behind them. If he moves, I can get a shot, he said and then the bold mercenary's SUV slowed down. What the hell is he doing? he asked. Terrell looked in the mirror. No name came to a stop in the road, and the captain slammed on the brakes, grabbing his weapon and jumping out. Dante opened the back door and joined him, leaning back into the car momentarily. You all stay in the SUV, he instructed firmly. Lily, get behind the wheel. If shooting starts, you get to the safe house. She nodded, swallowing hard and doing as she was told. Terrell led Dante at a run towards the other SUV and heard raised voices. As they approached, No Name turned towards him and held out his hands, motioning for them to stop. They slowed, confused, but slowed their run to a casual walk as they stayed behind the SUV just in case, peering through the windows at the scene. I was wondering when you guys were going to show up, No Name said to three QXR mercenaries standing in defensive positions next to their SUV. What the hell is this, Commander? one of them demanded. They're saying you and Kemp are traitors. That's certainly one word for us, No Name said slowly, but I kind of prefer the term retired. Another mercenary scoffed. So just like that, you're walking away from everything? He stammered. Just like what, Wyatt? No Name asked. I can't abide by what they're doing to civilians on that island, and neither can Kemp. He raised his hands. I have no judgment for those who can look the other way. Having a safe and secure life is more than most people can ask for in this situation. If that's the path you want to choose, then I wish you the best. However, if you want to come with us, we have plenty of room. The first mercenary shook his head. Afraid we can't do that, Commander, he said, regret in his eyes. So you really want to shoot it out with me? 
No Name asked, cocking a brow. Not exactly something that's on my bucket list, the mercenary replied. Tyrell motioned to Dante and they popped out from behind the SUV, both of them aiming assault rifles and spreading out into an effective kill zone. That's good, the captain said firmly, because if it was, then it would be the last thing you ever got to check off. Easy now, one of the mercenaries said, raising his hands. Let's take it down a notch here. I got it under control, Delta, No Name said, a warning in his tone. Terrell nodded. No doubt, he agreed. But we're going to be here just in case you don't. Fair? Fair, No Name conceded. So what now, Commander? The first mercenary asked. It's simple, No Name replied, crossing his arms. If you don't want to come with us, we hit the road and never look back at this place. You're putting us in a hell of a spot here, Commander, the mercenary said with a sigh. What do you think is going to happen to us when we go back to Theo empty-handed? No Name shrugged. Who says you have to? He only cares about us, he said, and pointed to the smoke plumes in the distance. That school building is going to be charred remains soon. Just tell him that when you got here, I was the only one left alive, and that you forced me into the building and set it on fire. You watched as I burned alive. Okay, but what about Kemp? Wyatt asked. And those civilians? No name shook his head. We have had a rolling battle all day long, with a dozen different places where we could have lost somebody he replied. He's not going to waste that much manpower to scour it for our remains. Not sure he's going to buy that, Commander, Wyatt warned. He'll buy it long enough for us to disappear, No Name shut back. You have my word that this will be the last time you see me or Kemp, or any of those civilians for that matter. The three mercenaries turned and conversed amongst each other for a moment in low tones. Terrell stayed on high alert, it seemed these three knew No Name more intimately than the other enemies they had today. Perhaps they worked under him, but they were waffling so hard that he didn't trust them as far as he could throw them. Finally, they finished their quiet conversation and Wyatt nodded. Commander, we have enough respect for you to let you go, he said, but you need to understand something. If you ever show up here again, we will not hesitate to put you down. We aren't going to put ourselves at any more risk for you. Understood. No Name replied with a nod. I appreciate what you boys are doing. Figure we owe you, another one of them added. Safe to say you've had our asses at one time or another over the years. Nice to return the favor for a change. The third cocked his head. Where are you going to? he asked. No Name shook his head. Somewhere west, he said. And honestly, even if I knew where I was headed, I wouldn't share it with you. The three mercenaries shared a chuckle. That figures, Wyatt said. Be safe, Commander. You boys be safe as well, he said, giving a little wave. See you in the next life. As they got back into their SUV, one of them paused, looking back at him. Commander? he asked. No name raised an eyebrow. Yeah, Levi? Seeing as how this is the last time we're going to see you, he said slowly. You mind telling us your name? No name smirked and gave a curt nod. Xavier, he said simply. Levi shook his head. Damn. I don't think I had X in the bedding pool, he said, snapping his fingers. But thanks for telling us. Figured you earned a parting gift from me, No Name said. The SUV took off, and Terrell and Dante finally relaxed as Kemp burst out of the passenger seat. Xavier? he cried, throwing up his hands. Xavier? Really? He poked No Name in the chest with a hard finger. I've been through hell with you, committed treason against QXR with you. And you tell them your name? No name smirked. I told them a name, he corrected. Pretty sure the only thing I revealed was that I am an X-Men fan. Kemp's eyes widened, and Terrell burst out laughing as the mercenary shook his head. Can't go wrong with Professor X, the captain drawled, especially since he just did some mind control stuff on those guys. Dante added, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. I swear to God, Kemp said, pointing a finger at his bold friend. At some point, I'm going to get your name out of you. No name winked at him. Many have tried, he said. Good luck to you. Kemp groaned and got back into the SUV in a huff. On to the safe house, Terrell asked, resting his rifle on his shoulder. No name nodded. Lead the way, he said. Chapter 
9. The two SUVs pulled up to the safe house, and Ace dove out of the SUV to get off of his cousin's lap. Good lord, I never thought that ride would end, he declared. Oh, quit your bitching, cuz, Lily drawled, rolling her eyes. You weren't the one who had your bony ass digging into my thigh the entire trip. Terrell laughed, shaking his head. Children, he warned. Don't make me put you in time out. The rednecks chuckled as they headed to the back and opened the back hatch to start unloading. Francis and Bailey emerged from the house to greet them, the hulking man looking around at the scant survivors. He clenched his jaw. Is there another vehicle? he asked stiffly. Dante took a deep breath and put a hand on his shoulder. I'm sorry, man. There isn't, he said gently. Francis nodded, eyes downcast, and Bailey grabbed his hand, giving it an affectionate squeeze. Did they make a difference? he asked hoarsely. Terrell stepped up, squaring his shoulders. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here, he said. He was stretching the truth a bit, but there was no harm in it, and it seemed as if it was something the big man needed to hear. No Name and Kemp watched the proceedings from a little off to the side as Grace and company went through introductions with the rest of the survivors. We did a good thing, Kemp, No Name said, unable to stop the swell of pride in his chest at the reunions and people coming together. His partner nodded. Saved a few lives while ridding the world of Mosley, Kemp replied with a grin. That is a solid day's work. Been a while since we've had one this productive, No Name agreed. Bailey stood up tall on the front porch, cupping a hand around her mouth. Okay, everybody, she called. Mama and I have been cooking a big old meal for y'all, so come on in and get settled so we can eat. Everyone started to file in, but No Name called out to Terrell at the back of the pack. Hey, Delta, a moment of your time, he said. Both soldiers turned and faced them, and Dante paused. We won't be long, Terrell assured him, waving him off and he and Coleman walked over to the mercenaries. "'What's up, fellas?' he asked. "'I know we're a good distance away from the action, but this isn't a long-term solution,' No Name said quietly. "'If Theo doesn't buy the story of our demise, they could come out this far, especially with the way that bridge is blocked off.' Terrell nodded. "'We good for tonight, though?' he asked. The mercenaries exchanged a quick glance, and then both nodded. "'Yeah,' No Name replied. If Theo does anything, it'll be in the morning, and most likely be concentrated on that side of the river. As long as we leave by then, we'll be fine. In that case, Terrell said, clapping his hands together, let's go enjoy a hot meal, and I'll bring it up afterwards. Kemp and No Name nodded, and the four men headed into the hustle and bustle of the farmhouse. The living room was packed with people, everybody enjoying the meal and making small talk. Dante glanced at Lily and Grace with a worried look on his face as the women hit it off quite well and started exchanging stories about him. No Name and Kemp were in the corner with Hawk and Eddie, scarfing down food as if they hadn't eaten in weeks. Nico told Bailey's sisters an animated story making them laugh with his funny accents and wild hand movements. If it weren't for the zombie apocalypse, it could be a scene right out of a very dysfunctional family reunion. Terrell couldn't help but feel guilty about having to break up the nice break, but it was time, as the eating wound down. He got to his feet and moved to the head of the room, knocking on the wall loudly to get everyone's attention. So, I know this has been a tough day for everyone, he trailed off, shook his head, and then took a deep breath. Hell, who am I kidding? This has been a rough month for everyone. We've lost family, friends and even a part of ourselves. I would love to stand here and tell you that the worst is behind us, but I'm not big on lying. The clatters died down as everyone set down their cutlery and glasses, focusing intently on him. The immediate threat from QXR is over, but as our new guests have informed me, it might not stay that way. Terrell continued, clearing his throat. They are still incredibly powerful, and have us outnumbered and outgunned. If they get wind of where we are, we might not be lucky enough to escape a second time. So while we are safe tonight, come morning, we are going to have to move on. Bailey slowly raised her hand, a light blush on her cheeks at the timid movement. 
Terrell pointed at her and offered an encouraging smile. Yes, he asked. Where will we go? she asked quietly. If we're not safe here, where would we be safe? Terrell took a deep breath. That is the $64,000 question, he said. The only thing I'm convinced of is that it needs to be far away from here. So if anybody has a suggestion... Seattle, Grace said immediately. A chuckle rippled through the room. That certainly qualifies as far away, Terrell said, shaking his head. I'm serious, Grace continued getting to her feet. I want to go back home. She inclined her head to No Name and Kemp. And according to these two, it's not that far-fetched of an idea. Everyone shifted to look at the mercenaries and No Name raised a hand. We don't have anything confirmed, mind you, he said quickly. But we heard that the military was making a play for Seattle, going to make it into a safe zone to start rebuilding. If they are successful, it might be the best place on this continent to be. And if they aren't, Coleman piped up. Then it really doesn't matter where we end up, Kemp said, since there will be virtually no hope of rebuilding if they lose. Terrell looked around the room at the downtrodden faces of the survivors. He wasn't sure if they were disheartened or if they were not looking forward to a cross-country trip, or both. Do we have any other suggestions? he asked. Maybe some place that we can get to within six months. Coleman raised an eyebrow. I know we weren't there long, but that Florence place seemed kind of nice, he suggested. You think that would be far enough away? Possibly, No Name said, tilting his head back and forth. But from what I understand, it's large enough that if Theo did come knocking that they could hide whoever goes there. Kemp nodded. And I can't imagine him getting into a confrontation with a community that size, he added. If anything, he might try to establish trade relations with them. Okay, so Florence it is, Terrell said. Grace leaned on her palms. If that's where you want to go, so be it, she said. But I want to go home. She turned to Dante. Can we go home? He took a deep breath and then looked down at the table. Lily grabbed his hand and squeezed it. Wherever you go, I'm going with you, she said firmly. So don't think you have to choose between me or Grace. He smiled at her, bringing her hand up to his lips to kiss her knuckles, and then turned back to his sister. Okay, we'll go home, he declared. Grace smiled and threw her arms around his shoulders before taking her seat. Thank you, she said. Well, shit, Lil. If you think you're leaving me alone in the big city, you are sorely mistaken, Ace declared, pointing at his cousin. She rolled her eyes. Pretty sure Florence isn't that big, cuz, she drawled. In his defense, hun, you saw where he was living before, Dante said. Pretty sure any place with more than two apartment complexes would be considered the big city. Lily laughed. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, she agreed. As insulting as that is, I can't get mad at it because it's 100% accurate. Ace huffed. Kemp nudged No Name and Terrell glanced at the movement, straining his ears to listen to their conversation. Might do us some good to get as far away from here as possible, don't you think, Commander? Kemp asked quietly. Even if we don't go all the way to Seattle. You just want a road trip, don't you? The bold mercenary drawled. Kemp shrugged. I've never driven cross-country before, he replied. Doing so during a zombie apocalypse might even add to the excitement. I'm in, No Name agreed, and turned to Dante. Mind if Kemp and I tag along for a bit? he asked. Dante nodded emphatically. After what you did for Grace, you can come with us anywhere, he said. Appreciate that, No Name replied. Captain, Coleman said slowly, raising his hand. Now that I think about it, might be safer if we go along with them as well. Terrell sighed. What the hell makes you say that? he asked. Because if we go to Florence, we're going to be out on the front lines, the sniper explained, which is going to make it more likely that we run into QXR, and that would put the entire community at risk. The captain cocked his head in thought for a moment, and then finally shook his head. Well, looks like we're going to have to find us a party bus, he muttered. It'll be on the list after finding some weapons, Coleman replied. If it's weapons you need, then you will need to make room on that party bus for Captain Nico, the weapons dealer himself declared, raising a fist. I have weapons stashed all over this great country of yours. You take me with you, and I take you to them. What's one more? 
Dante asked with a chuckle. Anybody else want to go with us to our hometown? As fun as that sounds, Francis cut in. I'm going to take Bailey and her family to Florence. They deserve a peaceful existence, and that is not what Seattle sounds like. Hawk took a deep breath. As much as I hate to admit it, the small town life sounds mighty appealing right now, he said. What do you think, Eddie? His companion nodded. Damn straight, he agreed. So, the rest of you want to go to Florence? Dante asked. Terrell looked around the room at the other survivors, all of whom were nodding their heads in the affirmative. Nico leaned over to stare at Kenny. You don't want to come on another adventure with your favorite captain? He asked, almost sounding hurt. I've had my fill of adventure, my friend, Kenny admitted, apology in his eyes. Ready for some peace and quiet. Nico nodded and gave him a wink. Okay, but I will make sure to shoot several things in the face in your honor, he promised. Kenny laughed, giving him a thumbs up. I would like that, Captain. Terrell looked around the room, watching everyone talk amongst themselves, spending quality time with people who would be going a different path than them. He sat back down next to Coleman, leaning in and bumping his arm. So, Seattle, huh? He asked, a teasing note to his voice. Coleman shrugged. I mean, why not? He asked. Would it even crack the top five craziest ideas we've had? I'm not going to answer that, for fear of questioning her mental state over the years, Terrell countered. They shared a laugh and he clapped his dearest friend on the shoulder. A pang stabbed his heart at the feeling that Miles wasn't here to enjoy this with them. To plan the new trip for them. They had to live double for him now. Chapter 10 When morning came, everyone packed up their vehicles outside. Francis and Bailey had two vehicles packed up with everything headed to Florence. There was one remaining vehicle in the driveway and Dante and Lily left it sitting to chat with the others. You have everything you need? Dante asked. Yes, Francis replied with a nod. Food, weapons, and a map that shows us how to get there without coming within 200 miles of QXR territory. Dante nodded. You be safe, he said, and don't take any chances. Francis wrapped an arm around Bailey's shoulders, pulling her close to him. And risk her life, he asked. Not a chance. They shook hands, and just before they got into the vehicle, Bailey launched herself forward and threw her arms around Dante's neck. Thank you, she said, her voice thick with emotion. If you hadn't saved me that first day, I would have been dead a long time ago. He smiled down at her. You would have done the same for me if you were in my shoes, he said. I'd like to think so, she sniffled and broke away from him. I would say be sure to write, but I don't think the mail service is running too well these days. He chuckled. We won't be able to write, but we still have the ham radio frequency for Florence, he reminded her. I'll be sure to let you know of our progress when I can. Her face lit up and she got into the car. You going to be good with just the one vehicle? Francis asked from the driver's seat. Before Dante could answer, a loud honk came up the driveway, and everyone turned at the sight of a school bus bustling up with Terrell at the wheel. It would appear so, buddy, Dante said, amusement in his tone. Would have preferred a touring bus, but what can you do? Francis smiled and nodded, starting up the SUV and prompting the one behind them to do the same with Hawk behind the wheel. Travel safe. Dante said, smacking the side of the vehicle and taking a step back. You too, Francis said, and the two SUVs peeled out of the driveway, headed for their new home in Florence. Terrell got out of the bus and everyone else came out of the house. Kemp wrinkled his nose. So much for traveling in luxury, he said dryly. Hey now, Terrell said, pointing at him. The seats are padded, there's plenty of room to stretch out, and if you behave, I'll let you put the windows down. Kemp chuckled. Well, when you put it that way, he said. Why don't you get the others going on loading up? No name suggested. We're burning daylight. You got it, Commander, Kemp said, and headed back towards the group, barking out orders and grabbing gear. You ready to make this drive? No name asked, turning to the captain. Just a short three thousand miles, Terrell replied. We'll be there by the end of the week. Both men chuckled. Realistically... We have about three-month window to get there, the bold mercenary pointed out. 
After that, most of the gas we're going to have access to will have gone bad. Nothing like a timeline to keep, Terrell said. Shall we, Mr. Bus Driver? No name asked as Dante ushered the last of the passengers into the bus. I swear to God, call me that again and I'm going to start referring to you as Miss Daisy, the captain warned. No name laughed. Been called worse in my day, he said. We got a long road trip ahead of us, Terrell warned. I'll think of something that will get under your skin. They boarded the bus and Dante took a seat next to Lily so they could cuddle, despite everyone stretching out in their own seats. All right, boys and girls, Terrell declared as he fired up the bus. Get comfy, because the road trip from hell is about to begin. The End This concludes the Low Country series. Coming soon, Terrell and the others begin their treacherous trip across the country in Dead America, The Journey.